Every year, Jehovah's Witnesses from around the world gather on Nicene 14 to commemorate the memorial of Christ's death. There's invitations, a talk, singing, bread and wine are passed down the rows. Witnesses claim this is accurate in how Jehovah God is directing his true servants. Is that true? My focus on rebuking the JW Memorial surrounds the passing of the plate. That's what separates this day more than others. Yes, it's the anniversary of Christ's death, except, you know, he's still alive. Kind of strange to have a memorial for someone who isn't dead, kind of the whole point of Christianity. Anyway, the JW Memorial's focus is the bread and wine, the elements, the communion, and how it's rejected by almost every witness. Yes, those in the earthly class let the plate pass on by and do not partake. I'll examine if it's biblical. Firstly, why witnesses only do this once a year? Well, the act of recognizing Christ's death once a year is fine. The majority of churches have Good Friday services. This is a long practice tradition, even going back to the first century. That's not really the issue. Talks and singing happen every week, but the elements, according to witnesses, that's only once a year. So where does the Bible say that? It doesn't. We have good reason, though, that the early church did this weekly, if not more. Acts 2, 41 and 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. See? All acts of Christianity. Teaching, fellowship, prayer, the Lord's Supper. It can't mean just eating. Fellowship is already listed. This is talking about partaking in the elements. If we go to Acts 20 and 6, it says, After the days of unleavened bread, the first day of the week, they gathered together to break bread. Even in the Didache, chapter 9 and 14, it gives instructions on the Lord's Supper, calls it breaking bread. It even says to do it on the Lord's Day, a.k.a. Sunday. But again, no scripture gives a time frame. Even witnesses admit to this. So it's just often, as often as you want. If this was so important to God, there would be a direct commandment. Anyway, on to the topic at hand, the body and blood of Christ. Now, the elements are rejected by 99% of witnesses. First, a little backstory. The Last Supper, it's Passover. Jesus is among Jews who have been practicing the Feast of Unleavened Bread and performing sacrifices since Moses. See, God made a covenant with a nation, a people he chose for himself. And once a year, the high priest would make a sacrifice of blood and flesh of an animal to atone for the sins of the people. Also, you have Moses in Exodus 24, 8. After reading off the law, the old covenant, he builds 12 altars representing the tribes, then consecrates it by sprinkling blood on the people and saying, this is the covenant in blood, done, sealed. Now, Jesus is surrounded by 12 disciples, saying the bread is his body and the wine his blood. He's God's lamb. This high priest isn't sacrificing an animal, he's sacrificing himself. This new covenant is poured out by his blood, not just for the sins of one nation, but for the world. Therefore, partaking in the elements is being in the new covenant, and Christ is your sacrifice for sin. Now, witnesses will say, no, 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 it's for the anointed class only. Where do they get this idea? A few places, like the Last Supper, Luke twenty-two nineteen. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup, which is poured out for you, is the covenant in my blood. JWs focus on the you and assume that's the anointed. Does it say that? No. Why doesn't he mean just the apostles or just the Jews? Perhaps it's you as in humans, all of mankind. How do I know it means this? Let's look at Matthew's account. Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Poured out for many. And this is repeated in Matthew 20, 28, to give his life as a ransom for many. The witness says, see, the 144,000, they're many, so he ransomed them. Not according to 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at a proper time. So this blood of the covenant is poured out as a ransom for all. John talks directly to this, 1 John 2.2, 2, And he himself is the appropriation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. John is clear, don't think this new covenant is just for a small, select group of people. The old covenant was for one people, this is for all. Witnesses will also read a little further into Luke 22.28, You are the ones who have stood by me. I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They'll say, see, now identified as the anointed. Now, these are two different conversations if you read the text. Jesus changes the subject when he mentions the betrayer, and the apostles start bickering over who will be greater. 
However, Jesus already mentioned this 12 tribes judging in Matthew 19, 27 through 30. Peter said, we left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Jesus says, you also shall sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. So Jesus is reiterating something he already said. You'll be pillars of the church, but anyone who leaves their home for my sake will receive far more. In Matthew, he goes on to share a parable how everyone gets eternal life, no matter when God called them. Everyone gets the same reward. Jesus is directing this to the apostles only. Anyone saying, oh, he means me too. No, he doesn't. He separates categories and makes it clear. Thanks for being my disciples, but everyone who believes receives the same. The next JW argument goes to, oh, well, you shouldn't take it in an unworthy manner. Okay, let's see what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 23. Therefore, when you come together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For when you eat, each one takes his own supper first and goes hungry while the other gets drunk. This is clearly about just using the body and blood in a flippant manner. This is supposed to be a moment of reflection, knowing what Christ did for you. But instead, you're just eating it and getting drunk. There isn't anything here about one class being unworthy. He's warning people, this is the new covenant. If you disrespect it, you're probably not in it. So there isn't anything in the Bible that says the elements are strictly for one certain class. It's for everyone who wants their sins forgiven. A witness might respond, oh, but the earthly class are under the umbrella of the new covenant. What does that even mean? There's no verse that says that or even alludes to it. You're either in it or you're not. Look, Jesus is so clear. In John 6, 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. In other words, if you don't put yourself in the new covenant, you're dead. Still dead in your sins, still a rebel to God, you fall short. But Christ mediates for you only if you're in the new covenant. Just like Hebrews 7.25, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 9.15, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Christ takes his perfection to God, wraps you in it when you're in the new covenant. You get God's seal of approval, not because of what you did, but because of what Christ did, pouring out his blood for your sin. As the prophecy in Jeremiah 31.34 says, I will remember their sins no more. Going back to 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. It doesn't say he mediates between the anointed. It's mankind, ransom to all, savior of the world. Paul again reiterates this, Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All of us are unrighteous, all have sinned, all dead, deserving of God's wrath, which remains on all sinners. The only thing that saves us is being washed and having our sins forgiven, to have a mediator who says, they're with me, I've paid for their sin. The only way to have that happen, you need to be in the new covenant. Therefore, you need to take the elements. That's what the good news is, Christ's gift for all people. He's made peace with God because of his sacrifice. The new covenant isn't for people who are just so amazing. It's for those who aren't, all of us. That's why it exists in the first place. If you want to be freed from sin, make peace with God. Repent, recognize you're a sinner, call out to Jesus, and he will save you. In response to that, you partake, showing God and others you're no longer dead, you're alive.